as a freelance writer writing for the marketplace, uh, the opportunity to be accepted as an equal company scholar is humbling and great and joyous. So I'm uh, thinking about, <coughs> after I finish my tetriad, um, of writing a book on uh, how the Democrats turn right. If I don't quit being a historian and start cultivating bonsai trees or something. <laughs> um, this book will, will be a little more uh, analytical uh, than the kind of, uh, kind of ground level narrative that I've been working on before. Um, now there are a million different ways uh, one could tell this story, and I'm um, kind of looking at this opportunity uh, as kind of a workshop for different ideas. But I'm going to focus today on um, the role of activist government uh, in the economic realm. And I think some of, uh, some of Meg's remarks would be really nicely complimentary. Uh, I imagine a first chapter called What Was Liberalism? Um, so a lot of it will come from Nelson's latest book. Uh, the kind of some ideas in which I was just absolutely dazzled and exhilarated by um, the capaciousness of the democratic capitalist vision uh, of the New Deal and kind of immediate post New Deal uh, era, in which figures like Robert Wagner have talked about democratizing capitalism. Uh, as not just a political imperative, but um, honoring uh, the, the letter of the 15th Amendment of the Constitution, which banned involuntary servitude. If you weren't in a union, you didn't have some say over how your company was run, you were something like a slave. 13th Amendment. 13th Amendment, yeah. thank you. Uh, and uh, what I just learned is to call, uh, quoting Carolyn Ware, uh, industrial autocracy. Um, how do we move away from that? Politically, uh, it's a story full of irony and um, a trope that occurs again and again as I look at this stuff is that the driving figures often turn out to be the people of most closely identified uh, at the time as the liberals. Uh, and uh, the guy I would kind of identify as one of the major thumbs in the dike uh, against this uh, economic shift to the right uh, was the Democratic politician most frequently reviled by the left. And um, I'm talking about uh, Hubert Humphrey. Uh, this part of the story uh, starts in the 1960s. Uh, as I put it um, in a New York Times editorial I wrote on the 100th anniversary of uh, the Minnesota senator's birth, uh, a forgotten event in all the people around Ronald Reagan's uh, 100th uh, anniversary, uh, it was Humphrey's misfortune to inherit the presidential nomination in 1968, uh, with the Democratic Party split down the middle between pro and anti-war factions, his defeat came in part thanks to his refusal to denounce the disastrous war in forthright and timely fashion, and in part thanks to the abandonment of the ticket uh, by the new politics liberals who called him a war monarch. Uh, he came in second place for the 1972 nomination, and then uh, uh, in, in the book by which uh, many would remember that election, Hunter S. Thompson's fear and loathing on the campaign trail, each mention of uh, Humphrey uh, drifts uh, with mocking vituperation. Here then, to many, is the Humphrey of history. The history also ran a sellout, a joke. Uh, for progressives today, however, the joke's on us. In the 1970s, uh, the Democratic Party turned its focus from a New Deal-inspired politics of economic security towards a Watergate-inspired embrace of institutional reform. We are not a bunch of little Hubert Humphreys, proclaimed Gary Hart, the leader of the Watergate babies, uh, Democratic congressional class in 1974. Their reforms, however, largely failed to liberalize the nation. Conservatives and business interests were able to bend the new campaign finance rules and congressional committee system to their own ends, something I learned from Julian Zeller's service work on congressional form, reform. Uh, that, in turn, helped bring about what uh, Paul Krugman calls the great divergence, uh, the economic inequality that has made a mockery of ordinary Americans' aspirations to join and stay in the middle class. Uh, the trends were already in evidence during the presidential season of 1976. The only thing uh, missing was any uh, organized democratic response to uh, the beginning of uh, the age of economic inequality among leading Democrats, besides, that is, Hubert Humphrey, who re-entered the Senate in 1971 and uh, spent the rest of his life doggedly devising legislative solutions to the COVID emergence. Uh, in 1976, he joined Representative August Hawkins, a Democrat from the Watts section of Los Angeles, to introduce a bill requiring the government to keep unemployment below 3%, uh, and if that failed, to provide emergency government jobs to the unemployed. Uh, it sounds heretical now, but 
but the New York Times endorsed it then. 70% uh, of Americans believed the government should offer jobs to everyone who wanted one. However, Jimmy Carter did not. Uh, Carter saw to it that only a toothless Humphrey Hawkins bill passed, uh, one that made fighting inflation the government's implicit policy goal, uh, while the toll of high unemployment was given a much lower priority. And then, of course, in 1978, Carter said uh, in the State of the Union Address, government cannot eliminate poverty or provide a bountiful economy or reduce inflation or save our cities or cure literacy or create energy. Uh, this was a generation before Bill Clinton said almost the same thing. <coughs> the era of big government is over in his 1996 State of the Union Address. Um, so that's uh, what I wrote a couple of years ago. It's a testament to the ignorance of our political uh, journalists, and no one remembers Carter said it first. In fact, it wasn't even new when Carter said it. Um, turning to uh, the Keynesianism, uh, the Republicans had a um, saying when they spoke of their political frustrations in uh, turning back the dominance of the Democratic Party. No one shoots Santa Claus. Uh, there was a political and policy virtuous circle in Keynesianism for the advocates of uh, the Democratic Party in that uh, the thing that was going to maintain mass purchasing power, uh, economic democracy if you prefer, would be a government redistribution, government spending, uh, putting money into the pockets of the lower half of the income distribution. Uh, and suddenly the Democrats, the party of um, government becomes Santa Claus. Um, but by the 1970s, uh, the Democrats were constantly shooting Santa Claus. Sometimes for good reasons, uh, sometimes for bad ones. Uh, William Proxmire, who left public service in 1989 and died in 2005, uh, may be best remembered, it's what I remember, for a monthly publicity stunt called the Golden Fleece Award, uh, bestowed upon uh, what he claimed was the most, uh, most wasteful and ridiculous <coughs> pockets of government spending. Uh, the pundits fell in love with the notions of good government pretensions, and for all I know, the stunt did some good uh, pairing federal budget of waste, fraud, and abuse, but the prizes often uh, went to basic science projects uh, that had ended up uh, leading to uh, important breakthroughs. Uh, of course, Proxmire was famous as a liberal. Uh, he's a hero among Wisconsin liberals still. Um, one of the reasons uh, Proxmire uh, who uh, practices public relations from a perch chairing the formerly powerless joint economic committee made such good copy was because he had a business degree from Harvard and had been an investment banker at J.P. Morgan. <coughs> How do you elect that for a liberal Democrat? He was quoted in a November 1972 New York New Republic profile by Tom Gagan, in which he finally alluded to Ricardo, Marshall, and Pigu, the grandfathers of neoclassical economics. He was Larry Summers before there was Larry Summers. <laughs> Uh, and this is um, the 1972 PNR profile. Um, the Depression, he believes, accustomed liberals to regard any public expenditure as in the public interest. Uh, Jerry Jasinowski, uh, as Joint Economic Committee uh, Staff Economist notes, uh, jo Jerry Jasinowski, the uh, Joint Economic Committee Staff Economist noted, liberal Keynesians kept saying the public sector is starved. Whenever there was a problem, say with housing, you simply pointed money in the direction of the problem, no matter how complex its social design. The, the result was to reinforce the most irresponsible kind of political behavior. They were for every expenditure and every tax break. Uh, Proxmire would quote his hero, the late liberal senator Paul Douglas, chastising his fellow liberals. They say spend, say spend, and they salivate. The source of this quote is significant, even Paul Douglas in his days as an economic economist had done uh, so much work establishing uh, um, uh, establishing that it was sound fiscal policy to stimulate consumer spending and then became one of the Senate's market liberals understood that things had gone too far. Uh, one of Proxmire's books was, called, books was called Uncle Sam, The Last of the Big Time Spenders, in which he argued that as late as 1960, quote, it was virtually impossible to get reputable economists to criticize the quality of public spending. Now that would soon be a cliche. Uh, Muskie, Edmund Muskie uh, spoke at the uh, 1975 Liberal Party meeting. Uh, this is uh, the um, epigram to Al Fromm's memoir. Uh, why can't liberals talk about fiscal responsibility and productivity without feeling uncomfortable? 
Our emotional stake in government is so much that we regard common sense criticism as almost a personal attack. Now that wasn't true. Uh, Democratic politicians have been saying the same thing for a dozen years. Uh, most prominent among them, President Kennedy, who at the speech that he was not able to deliver at the uh, Dallas trademark on uh, November 22nd, 1963, uh, was to have said, at a time when the national debt is steadily being reduced in terms of its burden on the economy, uh, he's talking about kind of John Bercher's and, and right wingers, they see that debt as the single greatest threat to our economy. At a time when we are steadily reducing the number of federal employees serving every thousand citizens, they fear those supposed hordes of civil servants far more than the actual hordes of opposing armies. So we hear resonances of that and Barack Obama saying, why are they so, being so mean to me? I'm spending less money than Dwight Eisenhower did. There was Jerry Brown, who clothed, clothed, his, clothed his austerian thinking in the hip Zen Buddhist uh, bromides, uh, and slept on a mattress on the floor, and was driven to the California governor's mansion in a sedan instead of a limousine, and with quote, small government nostrums he'd read in magazines like Commentary in the Public Interest. And Michael Dukakis, uh, the suburban, a suburban Democrat running for governor of Massachusetts in 1974 against a much more liberal Republican incumbent, and was said by the UPI to want to run the state like a bank. And last but not least, there was Gary Hart. Uh, in his memoir of his experience as George McGovern's campaign manager, he had written that, quote, American liberalism was near bankruptcy. In his successful 1974 Senate run, his outmaneuvered opponent, the Goldwater Wright, incumbent Peter Dominic complained that Hart seemed to be trying to get to the right of Attila the Hun. <laughs> uh, Hart seemed almost angrier at other Democrats than at Republicans. His stock speech, the end of the New Deal, uh, argued that his party was hamstrung by the very ideology that was supposed to be its glory, that if there's a problem, create the agency and throw money at the problem. It included lines like, the value who war on poverty succeeded only in raising the expectations, but not the living conditions the poor. So some of these nostrums are you know, manifestly false. I mean, when Carter says the government cannot control inflation, uh, and then you know, hires you know, Paul Volcker and controls inflation, and it goes down, and uh, you know, Jimmy Carter, I mean, uh, Ronald Reagan's able to win 49 states, and then blame Jimmy Carter for inflation. Um, it's uh, leaving money on the table, so to speak. Uh, that was false. The poverty rate was 17.3% when LBJ's Economic Opportunity Act passed in 1964, and 11.2% as Gary Hart spoke. But such claims did appeal to the preoccupations of people who Hart claimed must become the new base of the Democratic Party, those in the affluent suburbs whose political power had been quietly expanding during the 1960s through redistricting and reapportionment. He called those who, quote, clung to the Roosevelt model long after it had ceased to relate to reality, who still thought the workers, farmers, blacks, consumers of the New Deal coalition were where the votes were, Eleanor Roosevelt Democrats. He held them in open contempt. And by 1976, the leading lights in the Democratic Party, of course, were coming from the conservative South. Uh, Carter's closest advisor um, a, was a regional banker, uh, Bert Lance, who was touted for his fiscal conservatism. And, a major campaign promise was uh, balancing the budget. Uh, during Bill Clinton's 1976 run for attorney general, he kind of deliberately alienated the state's unions by refusing to support the repeal of Arkansas's right to work law. Um, my most recent discovery was that the guy in the 1976 uh, Democratic primary season who was known as the most liberal candidate in the race uh, Mo Udall was famous as a critic of government spending. I had no idea until I ran across this. And then uh, even more recently, I learned from Tim Phillips Fine's paper yesterday uh, that Felix Broatton, uh, the guy who, uh, the banker who kind of brokered uh, the end to the fiscal crisis in New York, who was very well known as a Democrat, uh, <coughs> had a shock impact by not only just cutting New York's budget, but overcutting New York's budget to kind of starve uh, public services uh, in New York. So we have a, a strange and ironic pattern of uh, Democrats and often ones who are 
identify <coughs> uh, Democrats of uh, making these kind of ritual uh, statements of austerity and being uh, lauded as uh, prophets every time they do it, even though the same game has been played for a uh, very, very uh, long time. It becomes, uh, as the kids say, a feature, not a bug. Um, and uh, of course, it, it's very hard to kind of maintain that uh, doing the exact same thing <coughs> in, uh, say, uh, 1977 as you did in 67 uh, with Keynesianism and its classical form uh, so manifestly not doing the job it was designed to do that, you know, uh, Democrats could not have changed their rhetoric. But what is so fascinating is how uh, the reaction, uh, what an interesting word, the reaction uh, becomes uh, an ingrained habit even when uh, the obvious, uh, obvious to us policy solution is uh, to increase public investment <coughs> such that, you know, when the unemployment rate is 9%, a couple of years ago, uh, Barack Obama is still going around uh, boasting again of uh, the lowest level of uh, discretionary spending uh, since the eyes of the heart. Um, so that's kind of what I'm playing with now, pulling things from various things I've uh, uh, been writing over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, and I guess um, my final thought, uh, turning it over to Nelson, uh, is um, my final thought would be uh, we need to think about, uh, as I always point at in my uh, historical work, the role of uh, almost willfully blind uh, political media in uh, enabling this game, and how deeply entrenched the kind of cliche and vernacular and sort of uh, rote uh, intellectual denunciation, uh, this kind of thinking about uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party uh, has become. And I'd love to hear uh, Reflection.